Next up, um, we've got uh, Chris. I think, Chris, this is your first time uh, speaking with us at Avid Trans, right? Uh, sure. Um, I attended last year for the first time, but um, yeah, looking forward to this as well. All Definitely right. looking forward to next year if it's back, back, oh, uh, yeah. back as an in person <laughs> event, for sure. Aren't we all, man? Aren't we all? Amen. <laughs> Amen, brother. All right. Well, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, hand it over to yourself and Andy, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to do a quick uh, presentation um, on live IP sports production and distribution based uh, or sort of centered around a case study um, that we've carried out over the last seven or eight months, which is the um, Scottish Premier Football League and their domestic distribution entirely done using um, various IP protocols. Um, my name is Chris Clark. I'm the CEO of Service Tech. Um, Service Tech was founded in 2012. Um, I put down 2014. Ultimately, for the first two years as a startup, we kind of floundered around in the dark looking for ways to make money. So we kind of put it down as 2014 instead. Um, our main business is managed services. We provide those under two banners. So Network One delivers 24-7 services and LiveLink delivers occasional use services, but essentially it's the same technology set underneath. Um, as, a, as a side project, we are accidental resellers um, of ATEM, um, Open Broadcast Systems and Zixi, um, so firmly into the IP distribution um, and coding space. I also put down our own company name because um, for the last uh, few months we've been developing our own product set, so those will be coming out in the market now, mainly supporting um, RIST as a, as a transport stream wrap. Um, we are active members of the RIST forum that Kieran mentioned earlier as well. This is what I'm about, essentially. So replacing satellite fiber and fixed circuit workflows, or at least offering an alternative in an attempt to do so. Um, why are they used? So um, if we take kind of satellite as a kind of major distribution workflow, um, the number one thing is its ubiquitous transport me mechanism. Um, okay, you can, you can technically go outside and turn a dustbin lid upside down and theoretically catch the RF signals. You know, that's how ubiquitous it is. It's there, it's available. Would you look at the size of the LNB on that antenna? Um, you know, that's in theory what it's capable of, but IP isn't really any different. And um, the other reason that those distributions work well is there's a centralized meet me location, whether that's a satellite itself, um, a POP or BT tower or an equivalent in a, in a different country or different region. Um, why that works well is that it decouples the responsibilities for the delivery. So it's not one organization's responsibility to get it from source to all of the destinations. There is this centralized meet me point. It's not the source sending organization's responsibility to configure the receiver's um, IRD to make sure it's hooked up to the right antenna, to make sure the antenna is even pointed at the satellite. It's also not the responsibility for like BT Tower or a POP to make sure that their end of the fiber circuit or the BT facility line is working. So completely detailed the responsibilities. However, the kind of downside to that is their expensive pay to play infrastructure. Um, you know, it's not cheap to build an antenna farm. It's not cheap to get BT facility lines. It's not cheap to put in um, fixed circuit lines. You have to have guaranteed banked business for the upcoming year or three year period to justify the expenditure on it. Um, and the other thing around sports distribution in, in particular is that making it available at BT tower or satellite is not a zero cost option for reception. There's an emergence of um, new players in the, in the TV landscape who you know, they don't have an antenna farm, they don't have access to BT Tower, they're having to pay service providers in order to get it from these fixed places to then re-encode it and deliver it to a place that they actually do want it, be it a facility or a cloud ingest point or a cloud node somewhere. Um, to look at the ubiquitous transport then, you know, cloud selection and availability of bandwidth, uh, it's only available if you know what you're doing, but the same thing goes with satellite distribution. You know, the RF signals out and, you know, step out into your garden, you can theoretically catch it. However, if you don't know what you're doing with it, you, you're not going to get anything. Um, so in order to get started into the IP domain, it's equivalent to, or if not cheaper than erecting the antenna and installing a required infrastructure, but it results so much more. You know, you can get a one plus one gigabit line into your facility and install the correct hardware to be able to land REST or SRT or Zixi or video flow, any of those equipment for a vast of reduced sum that enables you to then land 10, 20, 30, 40 individual feeds onto that infrastructure is so much more. Um, the other thing then is protocol selection. I've highlighted REST, SRT and Zixi as kind of 
our main part of our business is the delivery of live linear content as one of those three um, transport stream wraps. However, a lot of um, cloud ingest points, for instance, will take a HLS or an RTMP feed. They're not really interested in the linear part of it. It's more about the, the delivery mechanism to their ingest point. And it's not always the best for the job. What we found over the years is actually specifying, for instance, that you want to do Zixi delivery, but your target destination has invested, you know, 10, 20,000 pound into the, the ability to receive SRT fees, for instance, then trying to force them down an adoption of a protocol that you think might be quite straightforward, but actually has an impact of, you know, changing their API infrastructure and their monitorings and rewriting firewall rules and putting in infosec meetings in order to clear up a new protocol. So it's not always the best for the job. It's more about path of least resistance some things if they've already um, adopted one of the one of the protocols. Um, and the other thing that makes it ubiquitous is the competence with the technology. You know, it's only easy if you know what you're doing. Um, scaling up then, how do we tackle the, the decoupling responsibility? Um, so we treat the cloud like a satellite. Their, um, the ability to do rights entitlement of content. So what we're, um, what we're trying to do in, or in order to kind of democratize a marketplace, I guess, is allow one organization to deliver all of their feeds to all of their target destinations. But what if they could grant a rights entitlement similar to the you do on satellite? So the, the source content owner's job on satellite is to make it available on the satellite. They can prove that it's there by maybe doing their own downlink of a, doing an off-air confidence monitor. They're also responsibility for sharing the entitlement to that feed, be it through the configuration or a base key or however they're going about doing a cam slot. So we should be able to do the same thing on IP. Um, you know, the, the maths part of it is quite easy. We can scale up to the number of destinations, but how do we start to manage and monitor potentially thousands of destinations? And it's capable on IP. I think we've just got to, we're thinking about it the wrong way. We're always trying to do everything ourselves. And what you end up with is one poor guy in an MCR who's now trying to manage 100 individual links to 100 different broadcasters, all on different protocols, all in different you know, round trip times and different sets of monitoring statistics to come back. But it doesn't exist in the satellite workflow and it doesn't exist in BT Tower and it doesn't exist on fiber, um, fiber circuits. It's down to the receiving organizations to manage their part of it um, and not the sending organizations. The other thing about um, scaling up then is uh, self-management everyone's arguing for everything in one managed one single pane of glass so that you can see everything and um, so being able to contribute your feeds into the cloud platform be able to transcode or manipulate them to something else and distribute them if it's your responsibility to do the distribution if not hand the entitlement over to your customer who can then manage it on their behalf um, the other thing around scaling up is lowering the downstream cost profile and i have a, a slide on this roughly um, the rights costs around sports content um, can vary from you know tiny sums to some of the biggest sums that are that are passed around on the on, on the marketplace. Those large sums make sense for kind of tier one premium content, especially if it's short form. However, what we're hearing back from our customers is that the technical fees for receiving some of this content via satellite, because they're having to pay service provider, providers an hourly cost for downlink. Um, technical fees for the longer form content things like cricket tennis golf where you're asking someone to make that hourly commitment for kind of six to ten hours per day if not longer just doesn't make sense for some of the rights that are on offer um so you know a few examples i've put there very kind of regional centric for us in in the uk but in order to get a feed from bt tower if you don't have that facility line yourself you are having to pay someone else for the, the rental of the tower access line um, encoding into a format that you actually want it in or it needs to go over transport, putting it on uplink, um, therefore you've got uplink costs, satellite transponder costs, or putting it on a fiber circuit. Whereas actually I think making it available and passing the cost profile as a lower charge onto the end customer uh, makes a little, lot more sense for some of those rights. My case study, I did promise it, I best show it, show it to you. Um, so in July last year, we were um, awarded the contract from QTV Sports to do the domestic distribution for the SPFL. Um, it's important to note that we were awarded the contract in July and the league started on the 1st of August, um, which 
would scare quite a lot of people normally, but in the IP world, when we understood the landscape that we were operating in, it's no real problem. Um, the SPFL itself then um, comprises 12 teams, total of 228 matches, um, runs over a year, and there are broadcast rights held by Sky Sports um, and BBC Scotland. QTV Sports, our actual customer, um, they are responsible for the production of 142 of those matches and delivery to the broadcasters, to the clubs for their own um, online um, channels, to a stats organisation and to a clipping organisation. There's also deliveries to betting organisations in there now. What does that look like? Um, fairly straightforward when you look at it. There are a number of lines coming from the stadiums, up to six concurrent. Um, there's 12 teams, so um, six matches when they're all playing together. In order to manage overflow, there's access through BT Tower um, back to the production facility. And then if there are all six on concurrently, they can do another match, which um, we can pick up from Tower from them and then feed them back um, through the bottom part of this, this diagram. Um, these decoding channels are also then available to be used as off-air monitoring, similar to the satellite workflow where you say, okay, we know we're making it to our delivery point and we can prove that by bringing it back. Um, their mezzanine feed runs at um, 4208 bit, 30 megabits per second, um, and has a total of three, um, three audio pairs. And crucially, it's Zixi wrapped. Um, you know, the, the Zixi enabled encoders that are delivering it into the platform. Important to point out because actually on the receiving end, um, coming into the, the cloud processing platform, tried to do this as, in, as well color coordinated as I could, but uh, a video processing distribution engine is then delivering that 30 megabits per second, you can see it in green, it's delivering that 30 meg feed to the two um, broadcasting partners, so BBC Scotland and Sky Sports. Uh, BBC Scotland take it as Zixi, Sky Sports, took it as Zixi until last week, and then they made a switch to SRT through no real preference other than the, the, the software they were using to receive it wasn't supporting Zixi anymore, but it did support SRT. So we were able to switch it in the platform to actually then just send them an SRT feed. There's no point in trying to rearrange everything and re-engineer their own internal networks to be able to handle new equipment. It was easier for us to do the protocol switch. Um, Stream Digital is a, a company that looks after all, uh, almost all of the club TV channels. So we deliver all of the feeds um, live as a 30 meg Zixi rat feed to Stream Digital. Stats Perform takes statistics. Um, the statistics feeds, they didn't want 30 megabits per second. You know, they're only taking it for, uh, for stats generation. So they preferred a 15 megabits per second. So we were able to transcode it in the cloud, produce a 15 megabit per second version, and then send that. They chose SRT. The betting partner at the bottom also wanted the 15 meg feed as SRT. They also needed a progressive version to be wrapped as, a, as an RTMP feed and sent out to Gravio. For, um, for all the clipping mechanisms. What I've also tried to show in this diagram here is everything marked in blue, and this is the importance of being able to deliver things fast um, and trying to become the, uh, the perfect jigsaw piece that sits in the middle. You know, Kieran mentioned um, earlier about all the many incompatible islands. Um, well, we're trying to, through various protocol adoption, be the perfect jigsaw puzzle piece that fits in the middle of all of those islands. Um, those things marked in blue, and if I click back to my last slide, uh, if I can. Okay, so three banks of dual channel encoders and a dual channel decoder, and then one set of equipment that went to um, Stream Digital. That was the only actual hardware that was needed to make this entire delivery. All of the other partners had already invested in some way or form of ingesting one of these TC, uh, TCP, one of these IP-based um, protocols. So be it Zixi, SRT, REST, RTMP, and a multitude of, of all of them together, were able to affect all of those deliveries without a single piece of equipment being sent. It was just a matter of exchanging configuration. And I think that's where we'll get to um, going forward. You know, we, we often find various pockets. I think it's just down to how good the um, the product reseller is in a given region as to which um, protocol they've adopted or which one they, they, they really don't like. So it's important to be able to support them all. A um, couple of very high level kind of screen grabs. So um, this shows the, the various sources. So we've got the original source and two transcoded variants for each of the feeds. 
um, and then delivered out through the destinations. Um, the, the QTV Sports themselves actually manage every single delivery. Um, so there's a, a complete line of all destinations, a running timeline, and then all of the scheduled items so they can see which channel is being sent, what's the start time, what's the stop time, and its status. And I think I'm done. Um, wow. Open for discussion. Thank you, Chris. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, I can, Andy. Very good. So um, quick question for you, in terms of the, you know, the, the best efforts performance of these um, you know, over the top internet connections, what, what sort of performance do you see? And is the ARQ technology of choice capable of, in general, in most of the requirement, in the most of the deployments you've done of actually fully compensating for the pack inherent packet loss of a efforts network? Um, I, I would say, it depends on how realistic your expectations are. There always has to be a compromise, you know, where you're trying to save on uh, on cost, I guess, you know, by by not putting or not banking on fixed fiber lines or satellite transponders to do this job. You're trying to save something on cost. You have to sacrifice something. Now, if you don't want to sacrifice packet loss, because why would you? And um, then you have to sacrifice um, latency a little bit. So in, as long as you give the feeds enough latency, then there's almost no um, you know, internet connection that's not capable of recovering those, those losses. I run demos, thankfully due to COVID, I run demos from home all the time now. And I can bring you know, regularly twice a day on a demo and bring in 15 megabit, it's not huge, but 15 megabit per second um, broadcast grade feeds wrapped as uh, Zixi in the case that I use at home down to my um, down to my MacBook on my home broadband connection without packet loss. You know, it is possible, but I'm also putting a two second delay in, in order to compensate okay. for that. And is that is that two seconds a typical figure that you're using in the in your real world deployments? What what's, what's um, the typical I'm, buffer magic that you're having to do to get what you need? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So we find some customers that are absolutely hell bent on trying to extract every single little last second of latency out of it um, in which case we can run at you know two to three hundred milliseconds sometimes and we have some customers that have kind of six seconds of latency built in and there's no real one hard and fast rule what what i think um a lot of the manufacturers talk about is this thing called a latency budget and you need to decide how quickly you need that feed delivered and if latency is a key aspect so if it's a two-way interview or something like that then absolutely dial it down but it, there's a lot more optimization that can be done in your encoding profile selection for instance you know, we can take a, a, a typical contribution grade encoder running a three second encode latency where you can run it in low latency mode and shave two and a half of those yeah. three seconds off so you know where are we playing for latency so um but i would say in most cases if it's not destined for a two-way interview then decide realistically what your latency budget is and apply something appropriate okay okay final question for me and then i think we've got one from the floor come in um what what about the security aspects obviously when you're going over public internet security is key thing so give me a give me a 30 second answer on what your key tenants of security are so uh i'll take you back to how secure do we think this is um so the RF is falling from the sky and you can step out and catch it. But people think that it's secure because there's a best encryption key. But, you know, I remember days of trying to use a nine volt battery to hack your skybox in the kind of early 90s because it would unlock some of the channels and stuff. You know, there's always people who are going to go about it. But in terms of most of the protocol use, um, that we use anyway, there are inherent security built in. So there is the ability to do... Um, you know, AES packet level encryption on all of all of the feeds. It's also true in most cases that we're not just sending feeds out to no one. There is an established connection, although it's a UDP based transport mechanism. There are there is awareness of the sending and the receiving device, um, so it's not just firing it out into the middle of nowhere. Sure. There's also some pretty um, pretty heavy levels of of. A man in the middle protection that's been built into quite a lot of the streaming protocols it's important to use the best one for the job i think cool. um but but the idea that because the transmission medium is that which every hacker uses to get into things then you're already in their kind of playground if you like um but you know we've we've never had a stream be hacked it's not saying much yeah. but um you know the yeah 
Okay, leave it that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, hey, we, we've run out of time on this. Thank you so much, Chris. That's great. Um, we will, if anybody else has got any questions, I know Kieran put one online. Maybe you can go onto the chat window, Chris, and actually answer Absolutely. any questions people have got whilst we're in flight. Thanks very much. Back to Brad. All right. Thank and you. Chris, thank you so much. I, I really You're appreciate welcome. that. And uh, to your story about uh, the satellite not being secure, I specifically remember uh, you know, a couple of hundred years ago being called into a, a room at Turner Broadcasting to identify the Morse code identifier that was being sent <laughs> on a uh, satellite uplink that was actually swamping our origination signal for our national feed. So yeah, it, it, but that just tells you that security is a deal, right? If somebody was willing to go through that much effort to bust us, uh, you know, on IP, it's it's going to be more yeah. of a thing.